Hello everybody, it's Demon here. Thank you so much for tuning into the DemonCast YouTube channel. I just woke up, my hair is a mess, and don't remember what I was going to say. World's End Session Diary Number 1. Um, so World's End is the continuation of the Demons and Dragons podcast, which I kind of ended. Um, we have one character who is coming over from that. We have two players that are coming over from that and a new player. Now we have a session zero or an episode zero where they take the, in the end of Demons and Dragons they the players went, they collected an army, they brought it here to defend uh, one of their major cities and then um, then they decided to go kick out their Illyrian assholes from one of the cities that used to belong to the Freelands, which is where this takes place. And, um, Eric was having issues with his computer and could not actually talk. He had to text everything, which was terrible. So it wasn't really worth making uh, an episode one out of it. But kind of like sitting between the, as like the OVA between season one and season two. <clears throat> um, so the actual session. We start out with all the characters. We're kind of introducing the characters. They technically know each other, but they're not really a party yet. Now, Dryas, the reoccurring character from um, Demons and Dragons, has gotten an airship. His prize for basically the last arc of Demons and Dragons was an airship, because they didn't, they didn't make any money or any loot or anything. <clears throat> um, they have this issue where they kicked out the Illyrians. Now the Illyrian army is going to come back and they don't really have the means to defend the city. So Sarah's Ravenhold, he's this tiefling man, house, head of a, a prominent house in the Freelands, he's like, you should go buy us some guns. Here's some money. So they're being sent to the central continent, which is where most of the guns and gunpowder and stuff come from, to um, well, buy guns. <clears throat> so I don't really know how to get Jack on here. So all I did was, um, hey Jack, can you be recruited to help load the airship? He's like, I don't see why not. Um, Jake's this. Oni Sen, so he's kind of a custom race. He's a blue skinned guy. He's got these long cylinder horns. Um, he's the family persuasion, which just means he has to be around other people or something. It's, and he's like this psychotic jester bard. Um, so he's on the ship because he's loading stuff. Um, Phil, who's the alchemist, is it alchemist? Artificer? No, the alchemist. The one with the bombs and stuff. <clears throat> um, little elven girl. Just kind of like, as the army was heading north, kind of just got on to the ship. Like, oh, hi. And ended up in a war sort of thing. Randomly. I, d I, d I should not do this when I just wake up. <clears throat> What time is it? Um, so what I did with Phil is I dangled a drow in front of her because she is like, oh, shiny. Except in this case, ooh, drow. Like, yes, drow is loading up this cargo ship and she's going to follow him because I knew that was going to happen. Um, and when I said, oh yeah, the crate he's carrying is marked with uh, a thing that says caution, explosive. He's like, ooh. So, um, got him on the ship. And this drill's not happy being followed. So he puts the crate down. And he kind of backs up and walks out the door, shuts the door. The door locks from the other side. Yeah. So, doesn't know it yet, but he's now locked in to the ship. It's kind of a stowaway, but not. Nah. Is what they determined. <laughs> so they meet their new 
crew. They have uh, a human and a elven woman. Uh, the human's the pilot, elven woman's the mechanic. She knows how to run a bunch of the stuff. And um, they head out over the uh, Star Sea um, south. Next day, they land at um, the floating island of the Fire Isles. It's just kind of a port. Uh, their pilot picks up new maps, and that was really just like, hey, just just to let you know, there's there's a floating island here. No nobody's ever nobody's ever asked, but there's a floating island. Yeah, um, they go up, and as soon as they hit the Iron Serpent, they'll turn. And people are still like, Iron Serpent? It's a train, basically. It, it, it stretches from, it stretches across an entire continent, and it's this form of a train. It's not, um, it's not like our trains, it's a little bit different, but it real runs on a track, and it's a big metal thing. And it's loud and scorches the earth. Um, uh, I should really like comb my hair before I do this or something. So they um, they are attacked by the Anagi, and the Anagi is something that came in during Demons and Dragons. It's kind of like this aberrant demon thing that spawns in, and it drops this little these little magic crystal things when they die. Um, and that's really kind of be like, hey, this is still a problem. Nobody has ever tried to fix it. Just, just let you know. Um, but basically, they're on their airship. They have a bunch of these flying Anagi things to try to um, eat them. And um, there's a bit of fight. And uh, they fared pretty well. One of them dropped down to like, he was at zero HP, which is good. Um, these guys were scary, but they weren't terrible. And they go to this. Um, Hit the Iron Serpent, which is this line. It's not actually the Iron Serpent, it's the track for the Iron Serpent. And they head um, west, and they land in this little town that I forgot the name, so I just called it Dryland, because it's in the middle of a desert. And in Dryland, there are two groups. Uh, I guess you could say the Whites and the Reds. Uh, on the white side, led by Madame Ada, who's a tiefling woman, and controls, I think, the uh, sulfur mines. And on the other red side, there's um, Senor Hiram, Hiram, and he controls the coal mines. And um, so the group is here to buy gunpowder, but the problem is um, gunpowder factory is currently closed because the old man died and these two groups chased out the, the person who was supposed to inherit it, and they're fighting over the damn uh, gunpowder factory. Um, trying to gain control. So you have all this tension, and this is a um, fistful, of, fistful of dollars, or Yojimbo, um, scenario. Basically, there's two groups, they're fighting each other. Um, what the players are deciding to do after talking to Hiram, um, Hiram's like, hey, yeah, I got gunpowder, I'll sell you that much gunpowder, but my enemies have a lot of gunpowder too, and I can't separate with my gunpowder while well, they have gunpowder. So um, you blow up their gunpowder, and I'll sell you mine at a discount. What the players have decided to do so far, and we gotta go through planning and whatnot, is they are going to sneak into this place, take some of the gunpowder, blow up the rest, then walk over to Mr. Hiram triumphantly, hey, we actually blew up that thing, you can sell us your gunpowder. And he'll be like, great, and like, oh yeah, we uh, came up with a different plan. Bang, you're assassinated. And they're gonna take his gunpowder. Um, they have come up with the conclusion that this place is probably better without these two groups. 
if they eliminate both of them, they'll probably just get replaced by some other leader person who kind of takes over and whatnot. But maybe it won't happen. Um, also, leaving one of these groups alive while the other one is gone is just going to turn this town into a single dictatorship or something. So they're like, this is the best plan for this town, and we get our gunpowder for free. Uh, so I'm totally good with this, and this gives me enough information to set up for the next game. Um, I just have to figure out, you know, interpretations and what and what uh, monsters I need and stuff like that. So that's very useful. I did forget to mention Gabriel. Gabriel's a fun NPC. <clears throat> um, Gabriel is with these guys because he is trying to become part of House Ravenhold. Because if he has the power of House Ravenhold, he's going to be rich and powerful and yay. Um, he's kind of a con artist. Um, there is a scene on the deck of their ship while they are playing, him and Jack are playing cards. And, like, okay, he's got a high bluff and a decent sense of motive, so does Jack. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're winning on the bluffing and failing on the sense motive, so I'm, t I'm saying, okay, you're getting nowhere, do you want to cheat? I'm like, yeah, I want to cheat. I'm like, okay, roll me a sleight of hand. He rolls a crappy sleight of hand. So does Gabriel, because Gabriel is also a cheater. And, um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you both realize that you're cheating. You, th you like, you throw down like seven aces, and you both look at each other like, oh. Okay. Um, and it's just kind of like, yeah. Just put the gold back, get the cards back. Good game. Good game. Uh, we'll play this next time. And they get up, and Jack says, like, yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll play Dex next time. And Jack looks down into his, his bag at his loaded dice. And I just start laughing, because, like, the only thing I've got on this guy's character sheet is superior loaded dice. <laughs> so we had a good laugh about that. Um, Gabriel's kind of this coward. He's afraid of heights, and he's on this airship, so he's been terrified. Um, during the fight, um... Everybody's like fighting these big black bad guy things. There's like these pure black monsters with like phosphorescent yellow highlights and whatnot. Um, he sees them and he goes and hides in a corner. Um, and the characters like him. They like him because he's like, oh, I can make I can make fun of him because he's a pansy. He's this little. When I was a kid, we'd call him a girl, but the girls are up there fighting too. So don't don't take that as sexist. That that's my upbringing is. If you cry, you're a girl. Um, that's pretty much the end of this session. Wrap up. Thank you.